Hi, everybody. Peter Greenberg here. Welcome to another edition of our Global Travel Update. If you're wondering where I'm coming from, and I'll also explain a little bit later how I got up here, I'm coming to you from the cabin, the cottage of my good friends Rick and Tammy Hollis right up here in Shorts Lake. You know where that is? I'll tell you, right outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. One of my favorite destinations in Canada, by the way, because it's also the gateway to all of Northeastern Canada and such a great place to be at this time of the year as well. So thank you to Rick and Tammy, and thank you to you for watching. I'll tell you a little bit later how I got up here, which for those of you who think I'm immune to the airport chaos and the airline madness, think again. I'll tell you that story in a little bit. But first, let's update what's going on. You know the drill. You can also send me all your email questions. Send them right in here. We will answer them, and we'll do that right on the air as we get going. But first, a, no a couple of numbers I'm going to you. Number one. American Airlines last week talked about it, slashed 31,000 flights from the airline schedule in November. That's about 16% of the airline's total capacity. Well, not to be outdone, this week, British Airways slashed 10,000 flights from its schedule. That's already added to the 20,000 it's already cut during the summer. Now, why are the airlines doing this? Because they're trying to get their airline schedules back to be stable again? Well, that may be the effect, but that's not the reason. The underlying reason, or maybe even the catalytic reason, is forward bookings have tanked. As we're getting into Labor Day weekend in the fourth quarter, people have made a decision that they've been beaten up too much. They spent too much money. They got their travel under, you know, out of the way for 2022. They may not be traveling the rest of the year. And as a result, those forward-looking bookings are hard to find. And airfares are dropping precipitously. I'll give you one that I just found last night. Newark to Lisbon round trip as of September 10th, 500 bucks. I mean, this summer you couldn't go from New York to Chicago for 500 bucks. So that'll give you an idea of where we're at. So if you have any money left in your bank account after traveling this summer, or if you have any sanity left, this might be the time to be a smart traveler and look at those, uh, those fall fourth quarter bookings. We'll get to that a little bit later. Uh, airlines are continuing, by the way, not just slashing their schedule, but slashing their routes. United Airlines has cut. So far this year, 25 cities completely from the scale. Think about that, right? Americans cut lots of them. Delta is adding more each day to cities they're no longer serving. So we're coming up on Labor Day, and after about September 5th, 6th, or 7th, you're going to find cities in America with either severely reduced schedules or no airline service at all. This is not a good sign. When you, when you lose airlift, you lose economy. When you lose economy, you lose jobs. When you, when you lose jobs and economy, cities die. Now, there's an argument that those cities were alive before they had air service, and that's true, but we're living in a different world now. Uh, if you're living in Toledo, Ohio, as of September 8th, you have no service, right? I mean, Allegiant will fly in, but that, Allegiant's an airline will fly once a week between Myrtle Beach and Grand Rapids. That doesn't really have an impact. We're talking about American, United, and Delta no longer flying there. And there's no other airline that I know that's poised in the wings to fill that capacity or to replace it. It's not happening because under the EAS, that's Essential Air Services Law from Congress, uh, you know what? Airlines will, be get, will get subsidized to fly those essential air routes, but they've got to bid for it. Here's the question. Who's bidding for it? Answer, nobody except some guy named Vern with a, with a, with a biplane, you know, so... I don't think this is going to have a, a short-term solution. So fasten your seatbelts if you happen to live in places like Toledo. And if you happen to be doing business in Toledo, who's going to come see you if they can't get there? Remember what happened when the stagecoaches stopped showing up in Western towns? It's called ghost towns. So uh, we will be monitoring this a lot. Now, you've seen stories where the U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg has put the airlines on notice that get your act together or else. Let me define for you the two words or else. The federal government moves slowly. If they wanted to propose a rule today, giving airlines financial consequences for not behaving well, we still wouldn't see the rule before the end of the year, or early next, because under federal rules, they have to open it up to 90 days of public comment. Here's the biggest joke of all. After four years of slow walking, an order from Congress, mind you, the FAA is finally asking for public comment on this question. By the way, it's rhetorical. There'll be no time given for extra time to, to figure the answer out. It's an easy one. The FAA wants public comment on, get ready, are airline seats too small? Of course they are. Good luck with that one. But 90 days again before the FAA might make a rule 
establishing what they should have done a long time ago, minimum standards for seat width and seat pitch as airlines continue to jam more seats onto planes, which raises another issue about how you can safely evacuate a fully loaded plane with, with uh, half the exits blocked and in the dark in 90 seconds or less. That's the standard. And every year, the airlines are forced to comply with this. What a surprise. They all, they all comply. I'm convinced they hire the cast from Cirque du Soleil. Because, I mean, what's the, what, what's the, the cross-section of infirmity? Disability, age, sheer panic. Let's not forget carry-on bags that people like to leave when they evacuate a plane. None of that's in that equation that I'm aware of. And so the airlines continue to pass the test while the airlines continue to add more seats to the plane with less and less space and no width between seats. So we got work to do. But remember, the, air, the FAA has asked for public comment on do you think F, uh, airline seats are too, are too narrow? If anybody thinks they're just fine, uh, we'll have a therapy session for you immediately following this broadcast. But if you've got a comment, register it with the FAA. Maybe they'll wake up and realize that it is a rhetorical question. Fix it. All right, we'll move on from that. But we're not finished with seats yet. I told you I was going to tell you a story about, uh, about getting up here. I flew up here. Oh, no, let me rephrase that. I attempted to fly up here on Air Canada. Uh, from New York to Toronto, changing planes, and then Toronto to Halifax. Uh, I followed my own advice. I gave myself a three-hour layover in Toronto. And guess what? It wasn't enough. And in fact, the crazy part is that when the airline had to rebook me and give me a new seat, they wanted to charge me for another seat. I never checked a premium seat. That's a joke. How many people have gone on a, on, a, on a website of an airline to see the seating chart? And other than the dreaded middle seat where you're sitting between the two sumo wrestlers, they want to charge you a premium, even for a middle seat if it's closer to the front of the plane. This is absurd. It's another way to generate revenue. It's insulting. And you're not getting many extras, by the way, when they give you extra legroom. Um, unless they build it into, the, unless they bake it in, like, like JetBlue. You know, JetBlue does have extra legroom and coach, and they should get a kudo for that. But everybody else... Jamarama. So let's back up and talk about my experience on Air Canada. A one-hour flight from New York to Toronto turned into a five-and-a-half-hour flight. Remember the new rule that's being proposed by the U.S. Department of Transportation, that if you delay a flight by more than three hours, passengers should be compensated? My flight was delayed five-and-a-half hours. Where's my check, Air Canada? Guess what? I haven't heard from them. But it's worse. Because once we push back from the gate, already three hours late, we then stuck, stuck around for another hour at LaGuardia trying to get a, 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 you know, a runway. So the airline could claim that, oh, we, we, you know, we pushed back only three hours late. No, we didn't. So what time you actually lift off on the runway that counts? Now, here's the other thing. The minute an airplane pushes back, there's something on the plane called an ACARS. Don't ask me to tell you what it is. It's too complicated. But what it does, it's like a, a, a latter-day fax machine that sends an email, a, a message to operations at that airline, not only at the, at the headquarters of the airline, but to the station where the airplane is going, saying, by the way, they've pushed back. They're on the way. So when you land, there are no surprises. It's like none of these guys are wearing, you know, standing around the gates going, oh, my God, they've arrived? No, they knew three hours ago. So, of course, we land in Toronto, right? Instead of landing in Toronto at 1230, we landed at 430. And then we stuck around for an hour because they couldn't find a gate. They parked us in Siberia, right? So think of misconnected passengers and misconnected bags. We're just getting started. I'm one of those guys who believes that when you get your bag code on that little tag, you need to talk to every gate agent along your route to make sure that they have scanned the bag and it's loaded on the plane. Nobody in Air Canada would even admit that they do that. But they do that. So by the time I got to the gate, which showed a flight leaving not for my destination but for another destination, which meant that the plane was at our, that the plane was, that was at our gate wasn't our plane. The other plane that was for us couldn't find the gate either. Nobody could tell me whether or not our bags had been scanned. Actually, it was one bag. And now, instead of leaving on the earlier flight, which we missed, 
Now we're on the later flight, which they tried to upsell me the seat on, which of course I refused. Then what do they do? We're delayed leaving there again. And by the time we land in Halifax, a little bit after 1130 at night, no bag. Now, what happens when you get to your destination and there's no bag? You got to go fill out some stupid form at the baggage office, assuming somebody's actually manning it. And then they give you a form that has a case number on it, but they will not give you their phone number. God forbid you could actually call them and ask them a question. They don't do, they do that intentionally. And then they subcontract out the delivery service to some guy named Vern and an old Ford Econoline van, right? And what, make, what makes you think you're number one for delivery? Guess what? You're not. So that was my Air Canada experience. Now, remember, this is the same airline, and we've reported on this before, that in a very arrogant and stupid move, refused to give refunds to passengers whose flights were canceled by Air Canada during the pandemic. And the reason why Air Canada said they weren't going to refund the money is that, oh, we're only governed by Canadian law. Uh, not true. Under the U.S. Department of transportation rules that have been on the books for a long period of time, any airline flying to or within the United States or from the United States is bound by the rule that says if your flight is canceled by the airline for any reason whatsoever, you're entitled to a full refund back to your original form of payment. No questions asked. It's the deal. They can't offer you a voucher or future credit. That's garbage. And Air Canada flatly refused to pay refunds. Uh, a kudo here to the U.S. Department of Transportation because they did do an, an action an enforcement action, and they fine Air Canada $25 million. Did that get the airline's attention? You bet it did, but it, it took a year and a half to do it. And then, did Air Canada pay that fine? Here's the other little-known story about the United States government. Whenever you see stories, and by the way, I did this for CBS two years ago. It still, it still, has, it still has resonance today. It's still going on. Anytime you hear a big PR announcement that the FAA has fined an airline for bad maintenance or incomplete paperwork, and they're fining them, you know, $15 million or $12 million, that fine never gets paid. It never gets paid in full. It's negotiated down. For the airlines, it's like the cost of doing business. What's the point of an economic consequence if the economic consequence isn't adhered to? So what happened to that $25 million fine that Air Canada was levied? No, they didn't pay it. They negotiated it down to $4 million, and then they started writing refund checks and went back to the USDOT and say, see, we're writing the checks, and they got reduced even more. To them, the cost of doing business. Everybody who had a ticket on Air Canada had essentially written that airline an interest-free loan. So if you think I'm just bitching at Air Canada today, no, I'm bitching at the process. But I happen to be in Canada, and Air Canada screwed up. So guess what? Got on my radar, now it's on your radar. And if anybody's watching me for Canada, you're welcome to come on this show or call me or email me to have a further discussion about this to see what you're going to do to make it better. Not just for me, but for anybody flying your airline. Okay? Oh, Canada. Let's move on. All right. Now, this is the fun part. I I've been traveling a lot, you know, I uh, always do. I'm going to share some pictures with you from my tour along the way. We were recently in Fort Myers doing a show for my PBS show, The Travel Detective, and I came across this sign at a restaurant near the beach in Fort Myers. <laughs> I want to say in all fairness to my friends at Fort Myers, this is really not the food scene in Fort Myers, although the food at this particular restaurant was pretty good, and it was, and it was all fried, by the way. But I just had to share it with you because at least they had a sense of humor. And I'm sharing that with you now. Now comes the fun part. I talked to you about my Air Canada flight. When we got to the airport and we were delayed by hours, as you know, I found a woman set, sitting there with her carry-on bag. It was like the largest carry-on bag you could possibly fit on the plane. She had designed it herself. And it sort of talks about where we all were that day. Show that. She was obviously partying but not at the airport that day. She did that one herself. I said, I'm taking a photograph of this and sharing it with everybody. I hope she made her flight or she's clubbing by herself. All right. Now, <laughs> now comes the fun part. We talk about the airline trying to do the upsell of seats and nickel and diming everybody. Well, the hotels aren't out of the woods yet either. Those resort fees are back. Uh, 
bigger and better than ever. And it's more than just charging a resort fee for the towel or the use of the health club that you're never going to use or the Wi-Fi that they should be giving it to you free anyway, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, there's one other aspect that the hotels are coming after you for now in the summer. It's the lounge chair at the pool. They're throwing on additional surcharge for that. And we were recently in the Canary Islands doing a one-hour special for PBS. By the way, love the Canary Islands. But here's the fun part. This just ran about vacationers in Grand Canaria, one of the islands in the Canary Islands, and the starter's gun for the race to find a lounge chair at the pool. Go for it. Here we go. And they're on the starter's orders. He's going to clap. A whole swarm of them. They're off. Look at that. How mad that this is just like ants. Never seen anything like it. We're all watching it because we're all horrified that we've had to do this every day on holiday, Lella. This has ruined my holiday doing this. It's made me feel poorly. Look, they're all like bloody locusts. We are. I have been a locust too. All right. By the way, let me put this in some time context. That was 7 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> Crazy. Okay. Let's go to some of your comments and questions. We'll come back with our trivia question and a few more answers in a little bit. Uh, okay. Thank you for that nice note, uh, Nichrome, on the Tanzania Royal Tour. Uh, here we go. Hello from Toronto, Canada. I hope you're not still stuck at the airport like I was. Um, okay, here we go. Hello from Boynton Beach. Debbie always chimes in. Nice to see you, Debbie. Hello from Prudence Island. Uh, Rob Russ writes, uh, Tanzania is chiming in. Norse Air is mismarketing Fort Lauderdale departures as Miami. There you go. One of the new carriers, one of the low-cost carriers now flying to the United States, Norse is sort of like the inherited name of the old Norwegian airlines. So we'll see what happens with them. Uh, Patty says, hi from Kentucky. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, Zora and I talked last week about her, her trip to, her proposed trip to Antarctica. She's still trying to find a, an expedition ship. I already told you, it's Silver Sea. Their, their new ship, the uh, Endeavor, or National Geographic has one. Um, and, uh, and if you ask them who's going to go through the Drake Passage and fly back, that would be Silver Sea. There's now an air bridge, believe it or not, between the Antarctic and land, otherwise known as South America. And a lot of ships are going to stay positioned in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Antarctic for a little bit. And you can actually fly both ways or, or cruise one way through the Drake Shakes, where you'll have a nice conversation with a porcelain telephone, and then come back. So there you go. I hope that's, uh, that's helpful. All right, Evelyn says, greetings from Denver. Colleen says, 10 days to go before we fly to Brittany to hike the uh, the coastal route. Do you think I'll be able to get my collapsible trekking poles through TSA? Or should I do this without this time since it's a relatively easy route? The TSA defines a weapon in many different ways. And what's on the bottom of a trekking pole? A spike, isn't it? If it's a sharp, if it's a sharp object, they might, let, might not let you bring it on the plane. So be careful about that. By the way, in the next couple of weeks, on CBS, I'll be talking about what you can and can't bring through TSA. The number of items now that you can bring through TSA is pretty astonishing and actually quite funny. And I'll share that with you in a couple of weeks. Uh, one more thing about uh, about Brittany, you're in luck because the best butter in the world, it's in Brittany, and the best oysters in the world, I would argue, are also in Brittany. So have one for me. All right. Um, Marianne says, I'm going December 18th, Chicago to Los Angeles. You, you a return from, from, oh, from Fort Lauderdale on January. Sadly, using miles is outrageous, about 100,000. Exactly. This is the point I was making all summer long. Wait until September to book it, right? Uh, not now. They're going to adjust everything after Labor Day because there's going to be availability of award miles, not at that ridiculously high redemption level. Okay? So be careful about that. 
Um, okay. Good morning. Geraldine says, good morning from Chicago. Is Travel Zoo a good option to travel to Europe? And what are the downside of it? Okay, look. I search online with websites. Could be Travel Zoo, could be Expedia, Orbitz, Travelocity, you name it. Even, you know, Kayak. But I do that for research, not necessarily to book. Because the true definition of great service is not the delivery of the service. It's what happens when something goes wrong. Who do you talk to? I challenge any of those online travel agencies to give me somebody to talk to. We all know the problem. So go to a travel advisor or travel agent. Compare their rates with what you're doing online and figure out if it makes sense. You want somebody to be your advocate now, not just a transactional vehicle online. Okay? Uh, Okay, Katrina says, hello from Alabama. Um, oh, <laughs> Mike Lukens has a sense of humor. He thinks airline seats are just fine with his 30-inch waist. Number one, Mike, we now hate you, and everybody watching this show hates you. And number two, I appreciate the humor. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Donna says, I'm just concerned that some of the language makes travel agents and agencies will be held liable as well if something goes wrong. As you know, travel agencies can't afford that. Well, this speaks to another issue, and, and we could do a whole show on it. Liability. Are you the agent of me, or are you the agent of the actual travel provider? If you're the agent of the travel provider, and I would argue that you are because they're commissioning you, then of course you have to have some liability here. But if enough travel agents get together and form a, a union that actually works in terms of actually advocating for themselves, then that liability gets mitigated because the financial consequences should be squarely on the airline if they delay your flight. And I think the courts would uphold that. So let's see what happens. But remember, the real problem about liability and whose agent is whom gets down to even the online travel agents who will actually claim in court that they're not travel agents. Of course they are. They get commissioned by the airlines. That's why they're in business. So are they representing the airlines or are they representing me? If they're getting commission from the airlines, legally, I'd have to say, I'm not a lawyer. I don't play one on this book either. They're, they're, uh, they have some liability there. Okay. All right. Everybody's saying hello. Good evening. Um, okay. Let's go here. Ah, Joshua, thank you. I miss you too. I'll, I'm getting back to Tanzania soon. I promise you. Um Okay, Patty says, if you think you might take two international trips in the next year, should you go ahead and get annual insurance plan? Or if you're only certain of one trip, just get insurance for that trip. And then if able to do so, the other one. You know what? I'm a big fan of an annual policy, uh, whether it comes to either travel insurance for trip cancellation and interruption, or the one I always insist that you carry, medical evacuation and repatriation. They sell it as an annual policy. There's even a family plan. Please investigate that because... We still make our travel decisions sometimes at the spur of the moment, and you want to be covered, right? Now, having said all that, if you don't read the language pot, you know, very thoroughly, you may not be covered at all. So again, buy the insurance through a traveler or an advisor who can have that conversation with you. Do not buy it online. Okay. Okay. Ah, Evelyn is now giving me the A cars. I, Evelyn, I would have said that too, but I just didn't want to confuse everybody. It stands for Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System, ACARS. Okay, Evelyn, do you feel better now? It's still a fax machine. <laughs> okay. Um, hello, Victor from Tanzania again. Um, ah, Jennifer says, welcome to owning a travel agency in Canada. So upsetting and frustrating. Air Canada has been atrocious this summer. I agree. Uh, okay. Uh, ah, Jew is coming in from Japan again. Hello, Jew. Uh, Richard says, hello from San Antonio. I plan to fly into Ramstein, Ramstein, Germany. We know the military base there in September and wondered if it's less hassle and cheaper than flying to Paris and take the train. Well, what you haven't told me though, uh, Richard is you're not flying nonstop into Ramstein or Ramstein. Have, are you? Tell me how you're going and then I'll tell you what to do. Okay. Okay. Joan is saying hi from California. Have I ever heard of the Apple AirTag? Yes, I have. Uh, they sell for about twenty nine dollars. You have to have the Apple, you know, the Apple Watch or an Apple system to make it work. It's a way for you to track the location of your bag. Uh, you know, even when I landed in in uh, in Halifax the other night, there were at least three hundred bags stacked up in a corner that were not attached to anybody. They were missing. 
right? That's the old missing bag pile. Uh, sometimes it helps to have the air tag because you can actually tell the airline where to look because there's no one person out there looking for your bag dedicated to you. I can tell you that. Okay. Good morning from Huntington Beach, eh, Adrian. Um, okay. Here we go. Ah, Stephen says, college football starts soon. When are you traveling up to Madison and the UW Madison? What game will I attend? I'll let you know that in about two weeks. It is starting soon. They're, they're, playing, they're playing their first game, I think, in two weeks. The Badgers. Go Badgers. I hope they have a better team this year. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let you know. I promise you we will probably do our, our live global travel update from Camp Randall or at least Madison. You know I'm going back. Uh, hello, Samuel from Kenya. Um, ah, Tara says, barring all the things you mentioned, is it safe to go to Egypt now? I go. I don't have an issue. I've never had an issue going to Egypt, ever, even when they had some problems uh, in uh, in Luxor at one point. Right now, not a problem. I would go. Uh, and uh, guess what? The GEM, it's finally going to open, the Grand Egyptian Museum. It's either November 13th or November 28th. So it's, it's coming up. And it's a spectacular museum. But what you need to do, I've said this before, I'll say it again, spend extra money. It's about 250 bucks, but well worth it. And they'll give you a private tour into the workshops where all the all the uh, the restorers are working on all the artifacts that are being delivered to that museum on a daily basis. What they're finding out in the desert, it's almost endless. I mean, we're not just talking about a sarcophagus. We're talking about other things as well. Get back there and watch what they're doing. It's remarkable and well worth it. Um, okay. Uh, okay, Scott says, I'm flying with Ryanair from Rome to Palermo, September 23rd. Any advice on how to get to Palermo from the airport or what would you recommend? Well, it depends on where you're going in Palermo and how many bags you've got. If you're flying on Ryanair, chances are you've got a backpack and a bottle of water, right? Otherwise, you don't want to spend the money. Uh, but there is a city bus service. It's not that frequent at the airport. At this point, I'd tell you to take a cab, right? Throw in the money, get a cab. Um, okay. All right. Hello, Harriet and Jim. You didn't mention car rental. Okay, what part of car rental was I supposed to mention? Tell me, and I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Richard's saying, how do you find a reliable fixer or tour guide if I want to tour a country such as Thailand by myself? Well, Thailand, of course, is near and dear to me. I had a house there for 25 years, um, and uh, I long to get back now that it's open. Uh, it's very easy to get a tour guide in, in, in Thailand. Your hotel concierge can set that up for you. Uh, but once you get that tour guide, you need to be very specific. So, let's say you're in Bangkok or you want to go to Chiang Mai or Chiang Rai or go, go down to Koh Krabi or Koh Phi Phi or, or Koh Samui. You need to be very clear as to what you don't want to do, right? If you're in Bangkok, they're going to want to take you to on the river to see some floating market, which is very touristic. You don't want to do that. They're going to want to take you to uh, some snake farm. You definitely don't want to do that. What you want to be able to do is have a specific list of the things they must take you to and, and a list of things that are non-negotiable no's, right? And if you want to go see the Temple of Dawn, right, Wat Arun in Bangkok, do it at dawn. Don't do it at nine in the morning. Have them meet you at the Oriental Dock at like 5.30 at the latest. Go to the Temple of Dawn and then go down one of the side clongs to one of the local floating markets Nothing beats having a boat pull up to you and cooking migrop and pot thai and all the great Thai dishes hot from another boat to you at 6.30 in the morning. It's phenomenal. No different, by the way, than going to the Japanese uh, auction in Skigi, the old Japanese fish auction, at 5 in the morning and eating sushi at 6.30. It doesn't sound normal, but guess what? It'll be life-changing for you. It's that good. Um, okay. Uh, Peggy wants to know, how is Charles de Gaulle these days? <laughs> Uh, mon dieu all right figure that one out um all right um ah mary's saying you can't bring lacrosse sticks as carry on and you also can't bring on a baseball bat either so on those collapsible hiking poles make sure they collapse into your luggage and check them um okay uh okay denver to cancun wait until september seems like prices for a popular winter destinations won't go down oh they'll go down in september They'll go down in October. They'll go down in, in November. Then it starts going up again. Okay? Remember, shoulder season. 
All right. Hey, by the way, before I forget, it's time for a trivia question. I'm going to do this one because, after all, here I am in, near Halifax, Nova Scotia, out here on Shorts Lake. Another shout-out to Rick and Tammy. We're going to pull up the trivia question here. Here we go. Now, think about this. Not a trick question, but not far from here is a, is a, you know, a very well-visited location called Peggy's Cove. There's the lighthouse right there at Peggy's Cove, one of the most visited locations here in Nova Scotia. Here's the question. How many working lighthouses are there right now here in Nova Scotia? The answer might surprise you. And then part two, it's a part two. How many working lighthouses in the United States are still operated by the U.S. Coast Guard? In many cases, they've not operated them. They are either abandoned or operated by private entities or just nice things to look at uh, and no longer used as navigational aids. But how many still are? So how many here in Nova Scotia that are operational? And how many does the U.S. Coast Guard still operate and maintain in the United States? See if you know. All right, let's keep going down. Um, here we go. Tara says she's in New York City. That's nice. Okay, Clifford says he's in Aptos, California. Will the delays at London Heathrow continue into October? Currently have a one-hour, 20-minute stopover to change planes for the flight back to SFO. Uh, you know what? The, and you say this, the airline indicated that they meet the one-hour minimum. They're lying. There is no one-hour minimum. The actual, the actual minimum really in, in Heathrow is three hours. And what they won't tell you is, you know what the minimum is to, to, to connect your bags? It's four. Why wouldn't they just make it a four-hour change? Not three. <laughs> it's stupid. I actually believe that at some remote warehouse, somewhere on the planet, every morning at 8 o'clock, the airlines gather to synchronize their stupidity. I actually think so. All in the name of being competitive. Something's got to change. Okay. Um, okay. Um, all right. Samson says, greetings from Samson in, oh, Arusha in Tanzania. All right. Nice to hear from you the, at the base of, uh, of Kilimanjaro. Uh, okay. Uh, Jennifer says, airlines don't pay commissions anymore, Peter. Travel agents are in a, a tricky spot. Uh, Jennifer, I beg to differ with you. If you're a volume provider, airlines do pay overrides, and they always have. You just don't have a good enough relationship with an airline, then, or you're not doing enough volume. But remember, your value to the customer is not your commission. It's the overall travel experience. And, you're, and, and a good travel agent is not just booking airline tickets. A good travel agent is booking the experience, and you will be well compensated for it. And as you know, I'm an advocate for good travel agents, okay? I understand commission caps. It went, back, it, it went into effect years ago when Ron Allen at Delta did it. But I guarantee you, uh, some agents are more equal than others. The airlines will, do, will pay commissions if you're giving them a lot of business. Okay, uh, let's keep going here. Uh, okay, thank you, Emmanuel, for that nice note. Uh, hey, we got Michael saying hi from, uh, from Valle Nevada in Chile. Okay. Um, all right, hello from sunny Michigan, says Lorena. Um, okay. Ah, here again. I'm not here to anger travel agents. Stop it, guys. My comments about liability are well-founded. There's legal precedent for this. It's up to you to redefine that liability with the people who you're doing business with, otherwise known as airlines, cruise lines, hotels. Because in our litigious society, one person doesn't get served. Everybody gets served. Have a better relationship with your clients. Have those conversations. And you know what? you won't find yourself on the other end of a, of a subpoena, right? We don't have to get to that point. But if the airline screws up and they have to refund money or they have to compensate passengers, you should be a favor of that. And you should be part of that press to get them to do it. That's all I'm saying, okay? So if any travel agent out there thinks I'm, I'm, I'm saying the wrong thing, I got news for you. I'm not, all right? I'm on your side. Uh, okay. Here we go. Here we go. Hello to Debbie and Gina. Um, all right. Gina says, thanks for always supporting travel agents. There you go. Look, I'm not here to promote travel. I'm not here to promote travel agents. I'm not here to promote a destination. I'm not here to promote a hotel or an airline. I'm here to work with you on trying to figure out a way to navigate the travel experience so that you're not victims and you actually enjoy your trip. 
All right. It's all about the process. If you can understand and appreciate the process, that's when you value the product. So did I did I understand the process with Air Canada? Yes. Did I appreciate it? No. Did I value the product? No. Are we trying to change it? Yes. That's it. And enough. Of, and if enough of us put together rules that actually have teeth with with financial consequences for bad behavior, let me put it another way. And I address this not just to Air Canada but to all airlines. If any of you hired me today for any job whatsoever, and I reported late to work five hours late every day, how long would I have my job? Two days. The airlines are doing it every day, and we let them get away with it. We need different regulation. And I'm not in favor of re-regulation. Don't get me wrong. I'll give you one example. I said it before, but it's perfectly uh, uh, the perfect opportunity to say it again. There's not an, a runway in the world from Miami to Mumbai to Memphis. It doesn't matter. That can handle more than 23 takeoffs in an hour. It's a physical impossibility. You got to first get to the runway. You got to wait for the other guy to take off. You got to spool up your engines and you go. Two and a half minutes between takeoffs. All right. With me on that? Okay, so your cap is 23. Why are airlines allowed to schedule 38 departures at 8 o'clock in the morning? By the way, this isn't a pandemic problem. This is pre-pandemic, and it's with us today. Why? Because they want to be competitive, to give you the idea that you'll be first out of the gate. You'll be first out of the gate, but you're not going to be first to take off. So this is not a situation where we have to go bring a copy of War and Peace just to read the entire copy while we're waiting to take off on our 8 o'clock flight that doesn't take off until 10.30. This is basically about transparency and basic mathematics. Now, how do we get re-regulation into that? It's simple. Do a lottery. Do a lottery. And do it completely fair. So you'll say, okay, Delta, you can take off at 8.04. American, you have 8.11. United, you have 18. It's there. And then in the next hour, in the 9 o'clock hour, United could be first. But the point, and by the way, we don't care what you're flying, what kind of equipment you're flying. It could be a, a Cessna or an A380. We don't care where you're flying. We're not dictating any of that. We're not even dictating, you know, uh, the cities that you're not flying to. We're just letting you know when you can leave the airport. And if you miss that time, you go into a penalty box. So that airlines are going to have to say, our flight from New York to Chicago leaves at 8.11, not 8, not 8.29. And the next flight to Chicago on another airline might be leaving at 8.18. That's reasonable. And you can schedule around that. But to have 38 departures at 8 o'clock in the morning is not only delusional, it borders on stupidity. No, I take that back. It is stupidity. Because the math doesn't work. Okay, let's keep going. Um, all right. Ah, Nancy says, I'm doing a Danube River cruise in December with the current drought in Europe. Any thoughts about river levels and how this could affect the trip? My guess, I'm not a weatherman, is that the water levels will come back after October. It's been a terrible drought summer throughout Europe, and I think you'll be okay. Because if the water levels are still down in December, <laughs> no one's going anywhere next year. Uh, okay. Uh, Anybody want to guess the answer on lighthouses in Nova Scotia and how many lighthouses are being operated by the U.S. Coast Guard in the United States? All right. So far, all the guesses are wrong. Uh, someone guessed 160. Someone guessed 27. 41, said Evelyn. No. 170, said Mike. Sorry, Mike. Uh, 60 by the U.S. Coast Guard, said Mike. Okay. Actually, all wrong. Wow, Colleen, I got very specific, 177 in Nova Scotia. No. Uh, all right. Evelyn got part of it. Evelyn got the U.S. part right, but she didn't get the Nova Scotia part right, so I'm not going to say it yet. Uh, but thank you, Evelyn. Um, ah, okay. Richard now has come clean on Ramstein. He's flying military space, a one-way into Ramstein. If I can't catch a military hop back, I will go to commercial air. Is it less hassle to take the train from, from Germany to get to Paris or fly commercial into Paris? Very easy. Take the train. And why would you even want to come back from Paris unless you really want to go to Paris, right? If you're, if you're in Germany, take the train to Frankfurt or even better to Munich. It's less crazy than Frankfurt right now. But if you want to go to Paris, the trains work. Take the train. Um, okay. Uh, here we go. Lynn says, Air Canada and WestJet have been unaccountable forever 
and the federal government, meaning Canadian government, allows it. Well, here's a here's a little food for thought. I came up on Air Canada. Tomorrow, I'm flying back on a Delta flight. Not really. It's a code share operated by WestJet. Can't wait. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Larry says, thank you for supporting travel agents. All TA should carry uh, Arizona Emissions Insurance for that possibility of a lawsuit. My main emphasis to a client, call me first to help solve a travel problem. Larry, I completely support that. Uh, okay. Uh, Mary says, look at the number of flights scheduled for 7 a.m. departures at Reagan National. 7 a.m. is when the noise restrictions end for big planes. You know what? It's still the same philosophy. It's still the same numbers. They can't all leave at 7. It just can't work, right? And look at the runways at Reagan. You don't have many choices. Uh, okay, let's keep going here. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm looking. I'm looking. All right. So now I'm going to tell you how many lighthouses are operated here in Nova Scotia because none of you got it right. Uh, still operational. Here it comes. 150. But now, how many are operated in the U.S. by the United States Coast Guard? I was surprised by this number because so many of the lighthouses that I know and love uh, have been decommissioned by the U.S. Coast Guard. They still operate. They're not official aids to navigation like the lighthouse on, where I live on Fire Island in New York, built in 1858, by the way. And for those people who were movie bus, it was also used as the post office in Men in Black 2. But who cares? Bottom line is the number still operated by the U.S. Coast Guard in the United States or maintained by the U.S. Coast Guard is 700. So there's your answer. Okay. Now let's go to the photo of the week. Here it comes. It's almost there, the photo of the week. There it is. All right. Elaine Landell took that photo. Thank you for sending that in. And uh, where is it? It's in Crete. It's in Crete and Greece. Perfect timing, perfect light. Um, and, and, of course, what that photograph basically camouflages is how full Greece, Greece is this summer with, with, uh, with visitors. Best time to go to Greece? Coming up, September. That's, that's the magic month. But for June, July, and August, it is Grand Central Station throughout all the Greek islands. I know because I was just there. Uh, but anyway, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Elaine, for sending that photo in. Beautiful shot. And if you think you've got a, a photo that qualifies as the photo of the week, you know exactly what to do. Just email it in. And if we like it, it goes right up on the screen. All right, a couple of housekeeping notes before I run away, because I better get to the airport early for my flight tomorrow on WestJet. Uh, Travel Detective Season 7, still on the air. Uh, it's uh, still being aired on all PBS stations. And if you can't find it there, it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, also, uh, Royal Tour Tanzania, obviously still being aired, not just on, on PBS, but Amazon Prime and Apple TV+. And I've got a few more questions to get to, which I almost forgot that you guys sent in, so let's get to them. Uh, David said, did David Eisenhower talk about his father-in-law? For those of you who, who missed the show last week on our radio show called Ion Travel, I did a long extended conversation in Normandy with David Eisenhower about his experiences with his grandfather, of course, the, who led D-Day, Dwight, Dwight Eisenhower, The Longest Day, and of course, Winston Churchill. You asked her a question about, 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 about uh, Richard Nixon, his father-in-law. I did ask him about that, and you'll hear that in our extended conversation on our podcast, which I think starts tomorrow. Uh, with me and David Eisenhower, a longer extended conversation, Ion Travel radio podcast. You can go to our website, uh, petergreenberg.com, to access that podcast. Okay, uh, Catherine, any updates on pre-COVID testing to get on a cruise out of Italy? Well, cruise lines are going one by one by one, eliminating the pre-cruise testing requirement, not eliminating, of course, the proof of vaccination requirement for either their officers, their crew, or you. So check with your cruise line, but there's not a week that goes by that we see you know, Royal Caribbean and Carnival and, uh, and Regent. All these ships start to, to basically get rid of the pre-cruise uh, pre testing. Okay? Um, okay. What, oh, M Mary says, what's the best time to buy airfare to Guayaquil? Guess what? Now, if we're going after September 8th, okay? Okay, Sydney says flying to Portugal next month. What is needed to fly a drone there? 
Well, I can't give you a specific answer because each municipality has their own rules, right? Like any other location in the world, whether or not you're near a military base or an airport or a no-fly zone, uh, you have to be a little bit more specific before I can give you that answer. Um, okay. Uh, ah, Angie says, Peter, if you're a U.S. citizen coming home from, a, from an EU country, do you need proof of vaccination? Well, let me give you a hint. How did you get in there? You had proof of vaccination, right? You come home with it. Uh, okay, Kathy, where do I go to comment about the FAA's airline evacuation test? Go to the government website. And you know what? Anthony, my assistant, will, will send that out. We'll post it where you can post your comments. Remember, there are two separate comments here. Are the seats too narrow? And should we change the standards for minimum compliance in order to evacuate a fully loaded plane with half the exits blocked in the dark? So two parter here, two separate issues. One actually relates to the other, but they're being dealt with as two separate issues. Um, okay. Nancy, we filed an insurance claim, May of 22. How much longer should we expect to wait for a decision? Okay. Here's what you got to do. Email me with all the particulars, all the correspondence you had with them or any correspondence they had with you, copy of your policy, send it to us, peter at petergreenberg.com. We'll get into it, okay? Uh, ah. Francine says, if I had to pick between Rhodes and Crete, which would you see? You ready for the answer? Neither. I'd go to Paros or Satmos or Patmos or, or, uh, or Antiparos, beautiful islands that uh, are not out of control crowded right now. Uh, they, they were about three weeks ago, but now it's starting to settle down as we're getting into September. Okay, now not, nothing against Rhodes and Crete, uh, but for me, I mean, roads, they both have such great history. I mean, no doubt about it. Uh, but if you're going to go, don't go until the middle of September. Right now, it's just too crowded. All right, guys, one more note. Of course, the radio show this Saturday, coming from a very interesting location, uh, I'll give you a hint. Much of it is up in the air. Okay? I'm not doing that to mislead you, but it is. Uh, so tune in on Saturday. Check your local listings. And if you can't find a market in your area, no problem. Just go to our website, petergreenberg.com, because we're going to stream it live starting at about 10.05 a.m. Eastern on Saturday morning. I'm now going to leave for the airport. Fingers crossed. Oh, Canada. And uh, assuming I get back to the United States, I'll see you next week. Be safe, everybody, and have a great rest of the week.